I was about to give up my jewel this morning. Richard, thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, what you just participated in as an action of reading the Word of God has now helped to cement what you know into your mind even more than maybe it has been before, and that's why I believe Richard was saying maybe we could memorize things. I, I want to say that this Sabbath has been designated by the, the conference as a Sabbath that we can and should remember creation. And so I'd like to start out by saying, how many of you like to create? Uh, this is California. How many of you like to create? This is, this is the thing. Uh, those of us who grew up on the East Coast, you know, we heard about you guys, okay? Uh, you know, so much of the stuff that we enjoy in the United States today is created, is thought about and created in California. So the assumption, I guess, of, uh, of Eastern people is that there are just lots of very, very creative people in California. So I'm glad. I'm glad that you like to create because, you see, that puts you in the framework, the mental framework of understanding what we're talking about today. I've entitled our time uh, Creation by Design. And this is completely uh, stealing the name of my father-in-law's book. So if any of you know my, uh, my father-in-law, Chris's dad, kind of, kind of outing him today, uh, Harold Coffin. Uh, Dr. Coffin uh, was, I, I'm going to say, quietly intimidating when I met him. Um, let, let's just say that, that uh, he had gone to school here in California and done some very, very interesting research in uh, marine biology. Um, one of my favorite stories about him is the fact that he did research on hermit crabs. How many of you have ever found a hermit crab at the beach? We love Hermes. Hermes are so much fun because they are one of the most creative creatures that you will, you will find. They are exterior decorators. Okay? They take things and they glue them onto their shells so that they blend in with their, their, their area or not. Sometimes they just really make these rather fantastic creations out of their shells. But the problem for the hermit crab is that it grows. And as the hermit crab grows, it needs a new shell, a new house to live in, and therefore it needs to find some other shell that has been given away by another creature, or maybe the creature inside has died, and so they take up residence. My genius father-in-law, who of course produced a beautiful genius daughter whom I saw as a jewel, we'll, we'll, we'll go there later, uh, uh, he decided that he needed to study the, the reproductive system of hermit crabs. This is what scientists do. They, they try to stretch the uh, uh, knowledge base of humanity. So how, how do hermit crabs reproduce? This is a question that science asks. And he's a scientist, and he's asking this question. He's at USC, and he's asking this question in, uh, as a marine biologist. So how do you think he got to have a look at a hermit crab in the shell? This is now a question to you creatives. Okay, you want to study the, the hermit crab, but the hermit crab has a shell on it. So how do you study the hermit crab while it is in the shell? No, you're not going to drug it and extract it from the shell so that it's not in the, It's got to be in the shell. What's your answer? A little hole in the shell. Little hole? Okay. So the cameraman here, the cameraman here, he says, put a micro camera inside the shell. Transparent Good. shell. A fake shell. Okay, so the other scientist in the family is, is, is answering correctly. This is what my father-in-law did. He had a glass blower blow him 
shells. And in, in, in shells that would be slightly bigger than the hermit crabs that he had in his tank. And then he placed them into the tank about the time that the hermit crab was ready to go into a new shell. And so this would be the only choice that the hermit crab had. And so the hermit crab would obviously choose that shell. And so into the shell that was now glass went the hermit crab. And my father-in-law had a perfect view of whatever was going on inside the shell. I thought, you know, that was just one, one of the very brilliant sort of easy, easy answers to the question of, of trying to figure out what's going on in creation so that you can have a look at it that my father-in-law came up with. Um, so I'm honoring him today in many respects as one of the, uh, I, I believe, and, and, and I don't think this is a, an overstatement, one of the giants in creation science in North America and... Uh, uh, I'm, I'm honored to be his son-in-law. Uh, he and my mother-in-law have now passed, but uh, still we have all of his, his notes. He did many creation seminars for various groups of people and also taught for uh, the Geoscience Research Institute uh, right here in, in Riverside as the last thing that he did uh, in his life. So that is why I've called our time together, Creation by Design. And the fact is that we love to create and I, I believe that part of the reason that we love to create uh, uh, is because we get so much satisfaction from it. So this morning, here you are, you're reading a piece of scripture that maybe you have, have read many times before, and, and, and you're, say, you're, you're reading it, it's about God and, and about what he's doing. But I want you to just take a moment now in your mind and just go over that again, or open your Bible or get it on your phone and just look at it again and realize this is God in creation mode. And, and, and maybe you could relate for a moment to the emotions that he must have been having at this time while he's thinking. He's thinking, and as he's thinking, whatever he thinks is coming to be. He's, he thinks it, he speaks it, and then it happens right in front of him. Now, some of us uh, may have had the opportunity to, to be uh, uh, in a pottery class or something. Or, or maybe, like uh, some of us here, we like to work with wood, or there's some other medium. Uh, uh, Pete works with, with words, okay? Some of us, we call ourselves wordsmiths, almost like a, uh, you know, you're thinking of a, an ironsmith and, and a smithy but this time it's just on the computer and you're, you're going with this word or that word and you're seeing how things fit together and their meanings and the different nuances and so on. This is why we call ourselves wordsmiths or maybe you're a woodworker or an ironworker or maybe you've decided that you know, plumbing is your thing and so design. Uh, I, think of, I think of Birker designing an electronic circuit. Okay, there is a reason why we call these things beautiful, especially if you're a mathematician and you, 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 you create a, an equation. These things are considered beautiful. We get tremendous satisfaction. I wonder, I wonder if the statement that keeps being made in this first chapter of Genesis, and he thought that it was good, gives us the, the, the insight at this moment that God was enjoying himself as he did this. That the process of creation was satisfying to him. And I believe we experience the same thing. We are moved by the creation of artistic expression and we experience joy. This is, this is something that we can enter into, I believe, as we, as we look carefully at what God is doing at this moment. Another thing that we could think about is the fact that, that we create to reproduce. I mean, here we were talking about, um, we were talking about hermit crabs a moment ago, and, and that's what my father-in-law was, was trying to study from a, a marine biological per, uh, perspective. But we could also say that, that we think about creation as reproduction. Reproduction maybe, maybe of a thought or an idea that we have in our head that then takes shape as we make it happen in whatever medium we choose. 
But we can also say that part of the whole creative process that God entered into in creation was to produce his children. You could say too that his children are not just us, but they are the animal kingdom and the plant kingdom because they came from his mind. And we can see this in the relationships that happen not only in the human family, but then in the ecological family, we can see that there are relationships that God uh, put into place when he created. And, 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 and the word that comes to mind for me right now is synergy. Okay, that when this piece over here and this piece over here get together, there is something that is created that is greater than the two of them separately. And so we, we look at things that we now call ecosystems that we realize that if this plant was not here, you wouldn't have the same ecosystem. Okay? All of, these, all of these aspects of creation, I believe, brought God a great deal of satisfaction. It brings us satisfaction too. And we realize that the greatest disease of this era is counteracted when we create relationship. Okay, God creates relationship in, in, in his creation, and so too we are called as a community of faith to create relationship because it counteracts loneliness. God said about Adam, this, this guy that he had created, it is not good that man should be alone. And we think of this just in terms of Eve, but I'm going to maybe pull that a little bit further today and say, what if we were to say, this is God's idea of trying to instill who he is as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit into our society as humans. It's not good that we are alone. Well, why is that? Well, possibly one reason would be that we would be left with only our experience of God. And that the more people that we know and have relationship with, the more opportunities we have of getting to know God through how that person reflects God. So, could actually be a motivation for getting together. Because we can learn something more about our Creator because we get together. So, if we say to ourselves, God created, or that He is the Creator, we learn certain things. He created out of formlessness and emptiness. Now, some of you have been to school, some of you are going to school, and maybe you've been in a class where they were coming at you with various scientific uh, data, and that scientific data was derived from the perspective of evolution. Okay, I'm wanting to say, if we, as God-believing people, take that He is the Creator, there are several consequences that happen. If we take that, that He is the one who set the order of things, who put in, into uh, uh, being the processes and the protocols that cause our life and our world to be what it is today. I mean, let's, let's just take this for example. I won't do this because Birka will get me later. But if I had to drop the mic, you know this new phrase, drop the mic, and it didn't drop, from your scientific perspective, what would happen? You'd say, oh my goodness, it, 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 it only weighs like a feather now. Or would you say, gravity has been suspended. You'd, you'd go to the laws that we live with every day. All right, you scientists, how many pounds per square inch are holding us down? Come on. Oh my goodness, you've forgotten your, your high school physics. Isn't it 14 point something pounds per square inch is, sorry, what? 32. 14.7, thank you very much, that's what I remember. 
and, and this is just a random fact that's coming to my head right now, 14.7 pounds per square inch of your body is what is causing you to expect that if I drop this mic, it would fall to the ground. And you could then also calculate the speed at which it is falling to the ground. This is physics. We, we, oops, I did it. Oh, Birker, I'm so sorry. Please, please, I'm so sorry. Okay. All right, kids don't ever do that at home. Okay, it takes a professional to drop the mic properly. Okay. So this week's church budget. <laughs> this, week's church, this week's church budget is going to a new microphone. If we believe that God exists and that He is our creator, you know, the creator of our world, I believe that that is a choice. Because, of course, you have the opportunity to choose other ways of believing. But having made this choice, as I've said, there, there are several there are several consequences that follow. One is that if he is our creator, if he is the originator, then therefore it belongs to him. Um, what's, the, what's the phrase that I need to, to have in my mind? If I create some art, um, I have that as my, my piece. I, I don't want to say copyright. What, what's the word? Intellectual property. Okay. Could we actually believe then that as a consequence of believing that God is the creator, that we and all of creation is his intellectual property? Would that be a, a way of understanding the situation? Could we believe that? Yes. That makes him an owner. When you, re, when you returned your tithe today, when you, when you gave your offerings today, as scripture has indicated, were you thinking that? Were you thinking, I am, I am returning to the owner that which he has asked of me as one of his creatures. See, this is one of the consequences of believing that God is the creator. If you believe that he is the creator and that he created you, then you are his intellectual property. The life that he has given you is on loan and that it is his life that he has given you to live. I hope this is, not, this is not stretching you too much, but that would be the legal way of thinking about ourselves if we believe that God is the creator. How about this? Uh, there's, there's rulership. Okay, So if we believe that he is, is the creator, he's the owner, he's the ruler, um, he's the one who decides because it's his. We, we, would, we would give that honor to somebody who created a painting and it was put on, on show. We would probably ask them, well, how do you want us to show it? Uh, what's the lighting? Because it's yours and you get to decide how we're going to show this painting. But have we taken the time maybe to think, well, if this belongs to God, if I belong to God, how does he want to show me off? If I'm a work of art from the hand of the creator, how does he want to show me up? He gets to decide. He is the one who sets the order of things. He is the one who has protocols, the way you do things or the process that you follow. And why is that? Because he owns. So if we believe he's the creator, and we believe we are his intellectual property, then there is this relationship between creator and created. How about our, uh, another word that we often use, personhood, uh, deciding who I am. Okay, what if, uh, if, we, if we believe that we are a creation or a creature that God has created, uh, we, we are who we are, 
because he designed us that way. See, we're talking, we're talking creation by design. If he designed us in a particular way, then part of believing that he is our creator is to say he designed us this way. We are not our own. This is a, an important nuance. We are not our own designer. Now, medicine and science have been helping us. We have been able to tweak certain things about our Physio physiology, I mean, there are people with, with hearts from other people. Or uh, uh, one, one young lady I, I talked to recently has, has a piece of uh, cadaver bone in her knee. Okay, so we've been able, we've been able to work on the, the human body, but we are yet to create a human from scratch. Okay, so it's still him who is the designer of the human body. We can only follow protocol. We can only cooperate with the design process. And of course, that's what cancer research is about. We want to know why these things go wrong. There's a regular way and then there's a way that things start to happen that, that are not supposed to happen and they create reactions in our body. So that's what medicine is studying, is why these things happen and how we can keep them from happening. The rest of what exists, what we, what we see outside, uh, the rest of what exists on planet Earth was created to coexist, I believe, harmoniously. We are asked to come and to care for this ecosystem called Earth. Did you know that this was one of the first two commands that God gave to humanity? Be fruitful and multiply. In other words, create, or as we would say, recreate, reproduce. That was number one. Number two, take care of the earth. These are things that I'm telling you today. You know these things, but maybe if you stretch them just a little bit more, it will, it will be very interesting what we, what we say next. We have been given care for our living space here on planet Earth. Okay? I think that we need to be uh, thinking very carefully about that concept, especially as people who believe in and celebrate the seventh day of creation. Now I hope I'm, I'm grabbing a hold of you for a moment. You just have been, maybe some of you for years and years have been calling yourself seventh day Adventists. Well, that seventh day piece is what we're talking about today. And that it is a memorial that God sets up for himself and his creative action on this globe known as earth. Living, I believe, on this precisely uh, purposed planet was meant to bring joy to us and to our creator. Humanity was made in his, plural, in his image, to enjoy the same togetherness that exists in the unity that we now as adult Christians and children are learning this, we come to understand is the togetherness of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We see this as a mystery, but this, this togetherness that God is, it's a better way to say it, God is, we can have as we learn about community, as we learn about communication, and as we learn about commerce. Life on planet Earth was designed. Its design was perfect. Harmony on all levels was part of the original design. Again, back to physics. Some of you know this solid is moving. It has a vibration frequency. Everything in our world has a vibration frequency. So to use the word harmony, if you want to look it up in Ellen White, 
is a very important way of looking at what God created and where we are today with that. He created it to be in harmony. That was the original design. Meaning for life for us was found in being part of this harmonious whole creation that sprang from, from the Creator's mind. And it is still in His mind and He has the power to create and is creating. And if you read your scriptures the way that I do, He invites us to let Him recreate us. So this is, a, this is an ongoing process. It did not end with the creation of the world back in the day. It has been an ongoing process ever since. He is the one who is also healing. He is bringing harmony where deviation from the prescribed process and protocol have caused uh, disharmony to take place. And we can see that in our world today that the disharmony of people's ideas of how to live on planet Earth caused them to be fighting with each other. Both locally we can see that, and globally we can see that. God is, has come. He is the creator. He would like to recreate our minds so that we no longer act in disharmony with each other, but that we act harmoniously. I've talked already about copyright, so I'm not going to talk about that. I'm going to give you the good news, though, that he is also the restorer of our lives. He is into us cooperating with him for restoration. So not only do you have creation, but you also have restoration. And this, this I believe, was his intention ever since the rebellion began. That was the moment in which... Uh, an angel, a created being, decided that they wanted to be higher than the Creator God. Now, how this can actually happen, I don't know. Especially somebody who has been in the presence of God. But, the fact is, you and I have also had opportunity to get to know God a little bit better. And, we still... On a weekly basis, I mean, this is why we come to church to encourage each other, we still choose our own way. We choose to do things the way that we want to do them. We choose to create a situation that is disharmonious. So we can't just blame the evil angel. We have to say to ourselves, we too have strayed, we too have decided, and so there is a need for us to be saved, as it were, for us to be uh, given back the opportunity of being in harmony with God. Um, there are several, um, I'm just going to go straight to the, the end here and say that, that uh, there are several practical aspects that I wanted to bring out uh, and in the time, the few minutes that I'm going to allow myself, uh, I did want to bring this up. The word ecology. I am happy to say that very close by here in the Loma Linda University Religion Department, there are individuals who are studying in a new field called eco-theology. And I have at least one book in my library that it deals with this idea. I wanted to bring it up today because of what we have been talking about. If God is the creator God, if we say he is the one who created me, if, if, if I am a reflection of him, I am created in his image, and that he has rulership over my life, and that I attend church in, uh, on the seventh day to honor him as the creator God on that seventh day, then I should be interested in the world. I should be interested in ecology. We, we talked about it earlier that God has asked us all as human beings to care for the earth. How can we do that more? How can we be involved in our community? I want you to know that having lived for five years in Canada, uh, that we could learn a little bit from our Canadian friends 
even here in California that is ahead of a lot of the rest of the US, we could learn a lot more about things like recycling and uh, other, other ways of keeping our, our waterways, our air, and so on clean. I have this, this notion that as Seventh-day Adventist people, people who are looking forward to the return of not only the Savior Jesus Christ, who we also believe is the Creator God, that we should pay attention to His command to take care of the earth. We are Seventh-day people. That means we should be caring for the earth as well. A second practical application of believing that God is the Creator is that we would live unselfishly. Okay? God creates out of His abundance, out of His uh, uh, endless ideas. I mean, uh, how many kinds of giraffe are there? And did they all happen from God's mind? I, I think so. A friend of mine used to be into birding. Now he's into dragonflies. Did you know? Not many other people are into dragonflies. He now has two dragonflies that he has personally identified and they are named after him. This is on planet Earth, let alone the, the, the website that you can look at that says, oh, if you love your darling so much, why don't you uh, name a star after her? Pay 50 bucks and you can, we'll, we'll send you uh, the place in the universe where you can look and on a starry night, you can see the star that we've named after your loved one. Because there's just so many of them. Okay? But this, this idea of, of, of plenteousness and, and generosity, this comes from our Creator. This is the way in which He created and, and the, the mood that He was in when He created. And so I believe that believing, believing that God is our Creator means that we can be unselfish and generous. The third thing would be that... Uh, and I've talked about this before, but again, it bears, it bears repeating. If we believe that God is our creator, then we can depend on him. He is the one who originates it. He is the one that owns it. The, the, very, the very air we breathe, the very strength we feel in our, in our muscles that gives us the ability to go out and do the work that we do, that then we get paid for, that we use to buy the food we eat and the clothes we wear and the cars and the gas and everything that, that all comes from the Creator. So I, I believe that, that if we are believing in a Creator God, that we cannot help but live a dependent life. Um, another one that comes up right now is if we believe that this was done by design, that he had a reason for it, that we should follow the protocols. Um, somebody could easily say, well, pastor, uh, you know, you, you keep talking about Starbucks. Okay. So I must admit that I have been experimenting. And I've been saying to myself, do I really need that much caffeine? So I'm into decaf, all right? Others of you may say, uh, you know, my engine, my engine needs a good, strong French roast every morning. I don't know. Uh, check it out. If you believe that you are created by a God who has given you the abundance of the earth as a blessing, then how are you taking care of your, your body, your your, what, are you, what are you feeding yourself? This is, this is where this piece of what we teach as a Seventh-day Adventist church comes into play. If you believe that he's the creator, that he set the protocols in, in place, then when we don't follow those protocols and we get sick, should we be blaming God? We should probably be saying, look, I, I haven't been following as I should. So not only should we be interested in the, in the earth, not only should we be unselfish, not only should we have a dependent attitude, I, I believe that we should have, okay, this is, the, this is the hard word, obedience. 
I, I choose to use the word follow, that we would actually follow and not be like the little child who the mother is walking along and the little child wants to go over here. Okay, but that we should follow what our Creator has outlined for us. I believe that creation by design is gaining momentum in our society today. We should not be apologizing for our stance. There are many who have been part of the evolutionary kingdom or evolutionary belief system who are now accepting ID, intelligent design. Now, they, don't still, they still don't want to talk to you about God, okay? And they're, they're not going to talk about the flood. They're going to talk about a cataclysmic event. But it's the flood, okay? They are going to say that they cannot, within their idea of evolution, explain everything that's going on in our world. As a result of that, many of them are coming, you could say, to faith, not in God, but in the idea of intelligent design. I say, hallelujah, that there's an opportunity for us who do believe in a creator God to have conversations with individuals who may be struggling with faith in God and say, you know what, there's a lot of people who still believe in, in the theory of evolution but they're now coming to say that doesn't explain everything. There's something else. And we can say, yep, you know what? There's someone else. And his name is God. And he, he has come in the form of Jesus Christ. And he wants nothing more than to bring us back into harmony together with him. And that we would never die. And that we would live forever is what he wants more than anything else. How about it? And then they can say, well, that sounds a whole lot better than this uh, evolutionary theory that says, if I am not the fittest, I'm not going to survive. See? So we, we, we've emphasized today the whole idea that creation, if you, if you believe in God as the creator, it affects the whole way that you live your life. Because if you're, if you're believing in survival of the fittest, that's a whole nother way of living. That's a whole nother way of living. So as, as, you, as you maybe make the application in your own life this afternoon when you think about it, maybe in your prayer time this week when you think about it, uh, it, it does take a little time to sink in. The ramifications, the, 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 the things that happen, the, the, the consequences that happen if you really, really believe that God is your creator. May you this week come in contact with opportunities not only to understand this more fully yourself, but to help somebody else understand it too. In Jesus' name.